All right, well, hello everyone. Welcome to episode 17. Today I'm gonna to be talking about gene expression. So far in this little series on genetics, I've covered the structure and basic physiology of DNA. I've also covered translation, RNA processing and transcription, and the most recent episode was about how the cell builds and repairs DNA. This episode will scale things up a little bit. I'm going to be referencing some of the material I covered in the previous episodes, like transcription regulators and ribosomes, but I'm going to frame it in a larger context. Where I was focusing on DNA at the level of the nucleotide base and the enzyme, today I'm zooming out a little bit to the level of genes and chromosomes. Specifically, I'm going to discuss how genes are expressed and how the cell regulates that expression. Let's start with the basics. Every cell in your body, with the exception of gametes, contains two copies of 23 different chromosomes. Each copy of a chromosome has a unique blend of traits inherited from both your parents. These traits, like stuff like green eyes or black hair or your height, are coded for by alleles. An allele is like a version of a gene. Everyone has a gene for hair color, but we each have only a few specific alleles for a particular hair color. Similarly, everyone has a gene for eye color, but every individual has different alleles for different eye colors, like green or basil or brown. Alleles exist in every species for virtually every trait you can think of. Mammals have alleles for their fur color, or alleles for functional traits in the fur, like water resistance or heat retention. Reptiles have alleles for patterns on their scales, like coloration that would help them absorb or reflect light. Insects have alleles for the shape of their wings, and for the positioning of their limbs and joints. Gregor Mendel studied peas with alleles for color and shape of their seeds. And other plants have alleles for stuff like the shape and size of their leaves, the color of their flowers, or the composition of their bark. As you could have surmised, a gene is a portion of the DNA that codes for a particular trait, or regulates the expression of another gene. On a chemical level, the gene is a sequence of bases within the DNA. In the case of protein coding genes, the genetic code is read three bases at a time and matched to corresponding amino acids. The amino acids are then linked together in a chain according to the coding sequence in the gene. This amino acid chain, this polypeptide, then folds up on itself to make a protein. Through this process, genes can be transcribed and translated into proteins, which do all sorts of stuff throughout the cell. When you think of all the actions taken by all the proteins and enzymes in a cell, the inside of the cell can seem like a crazy and chaotic place. I mean, it kind of is, but there's an order to this chaos, a method to the madness, so to speak. You see, if a cell expressed all of its genes all the time, it would destroy itself. The cell would have to gorge on nutrients to sustain the protein synthesis, and the subsequent protein activity would be totally out of control. It would be, it would be madness. The cell would die. To administer a little order to this chemical wilderness, the cell engages in selective expression of particular genes. Have you ever wondered how all your cells can have the exact same genome, you know, your genome, yet be wildly different? Your skin cells are flat and heavily layered, but the cells lining your intestines are shaped like columns and loosely packed to maximize their surface area. The muscle cells in your legs are like long, powerful cords or ropes, but the cells in your eyes are small, delicate, and sensitive to light. The cells in your bones are isolated from one another in a matrix of calcium salts but the cells in your brain are all closely intertwined and interconnected. Despite all of these differences in form and function, skin cells and intestinal cells, muscle cells and retinal cells, bone cells and neurons, all have the same total set of genes, the same genome. The obvious question then is how are all of these cells so different when they have the same genes? The answer is differential gene expression. This means that each cell in your body only accesses and expresses a small and very specific portion of the genes in your total genome. Neurons express a far different set of genes than bone cells, for example, just as um, retinal cells express a totally different set of genes than muscle cells. In each case, the cell has access to this set of genes, and so it expresses these genes in a carefully regulated way. It's almost like an orchestra. If every instrument played all at once, with impressive but uncoordinated passion, you'd just hear noise. It would be a calamity. It'd be a disaster. The composer would be embarrassed. But if every instrument plays in coordination with one another, with some instruments coming in only for a moment while others play longer, or some instruments might play for the entire piece while others only have a single note, 
The result of this is a beautiful symphony, you know, and in much the same way, the cell has to express its genes like a conductor leading an orchestra. The gene expression must be handled with finesse and care so that the cell can maintain the delicate chemical balance called life. Some genes are expressed rarely, or only in very specific circumstances, while other genes are expressed frequently. Constitutive genes are those that are constantly expressed, as they relate to some kind of base function like cellular respiration. Furthermore, a cell is under intense pressure to express its genes effectively and efficiently. Expressing a gene when you don't need to just wastes chemical resources. Well, since the cell recycles everything, it's like putting some of its resources in pointless projects that just tie everything up. The cell would have fewer resources with which to build the proteins that it actually needs. This can be mortally dangerous for single-celled organisms, and it can be dangerous for cells within larger eukaryotic organisms, too. In eukaryotes, faulty gene expression can often be fatal to the organism itself. So now we get into the meat and potatoes of the episode. How does the cell regulate the expression of various genes? How does it go about mastering this chemical orchestra so as to play a symphony by growing properly and staying alive? Recall the mechanisms of gene expression from gene to protein. The gene contains the encoded information, which is read during transcription, translated into a protein, and the protein then modified in some way so as to activate it. The cell can stick its foot in the door at any of these steps in the process, thereby controlling the expression of the gene. Transcriptional control prevents the DNA from being read in the first place. But if the DNA happens to get read anyway, transcriptional control will prevent a molecule of mRNA from being created. In this way, transcriptional control is the most efficient, as it prevents resources from being tied up in an mRNA or a protein molecule. A downside of transcriptional control is that it's relatively slow, responding lazily to changes in the cell's environment. The next step is translational control, and this prevents the mRNA from being translated into a protein, usually by interfering with or shutting down the ribosome in some capacity. Because the mRNA is already present at this step, the cell can translate it or not depending on various factors. Post-translational control is pretty simple, as it just involves the activation or minor modification of an otherwise finished protein. This regulatory step can be very quick, but it requires tapping the cell's supplies of energy molecules like ATP, which make this kind of regulation energetically expensive. I'm going to go into more detail on the regulation of genes at each of these steps. Okay, so at the first step, at transcriptional control, there's two basic methods for regulating gene expression. These two methods are positive or negative control. It's pretty intuitive. Positive control involves the activation of stuff, while negative control involves shutting down stuff or stopping something. To be more specific, positive control uses proteins called activators, and these activators, they bind to specific points on the DNA and initiate transcription. In episode 15 about transcription and translation, I briefly discussed how the RNA polymerase molecule has to bind to promoter proteins at an initiator region. These promoter proteins are activators. They bind to a point on the DNA like an initiator region, and they attract enzymes like RNA polymerase, which begin transcription. On the other hand, we have negative control, which uses proteins called repressors. The repressor protein binds to the DNA, but instead of enabling transcription, it interferes with the enzymatic machinery involved in transcription and shuts the whole process down. An important part of this process that we can't overlook is the DNA sequence that the activators and repressors bind to. These regions are called promoters, operators, or initiators, and they're important for the regulation of gene expression. When a gene or a set of genes needs to be expressed, a specific activator is synthesized. The activator protein binds to the promoter region, and this attracts a molecule of RNA polymerase. Sets of different genes can all share the same initiator sequence, so when an enzyme is synthesized that can activate that particular sequence, it activates the expression of every gene in the set. These expressed genes will then go on to produce proteins, and these will perform whatever function the cell needs. Genes that are expressed in groups or sets like this typically code for proteins that interact or work together. Let's say that there's some biochemical process that requires an enzyme complex, just a big heaping mass of dozens of different proteins, all cooperating to perform some kind of reaction. It would be very inefficient for the cell to individually activate all the genes needed for the enzyme complex. For example, 
If two dozen genes all have different initiator regions, the cell needs to create two dozen different kinds of activators or repressors to regulate their, their expression. Instead, each gene involved in coding the proteins of the enzyme complex all have the same initiator sequence. This sequence lies at the start of the gene. So a bound activator protein will attract an RNA polymerase and position it right where it needs to be in order to begin transcription. This way, the cell only needs to produce a single type of activator protein to express multiple genes. When a cloud of this one type of protein floats around the DNA, it'll only bind with its specific initiator sequences, and as a result, those specific genes are then expressed. The proteins for the complex are all produced at once, all from a single triggering enzyme, and they assemble together to rapidly form a functional enzyme complex. This process allows groups of genes, or individual genes, to be selectively expressed in a very deliberate and careful manner. The cell expresses only the genes that code for the proteins it needs at that moment, for, you know, whatever purpose. This finely tuned regulation at the start of transcription really maximizes the efficient use of resources in the cell by nipping in the bud any transcription process that would be stopped further down the chemical pathway. The positive and negative control mechanisms I've just described exist in both single-celled bacteria and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes share a transcriptional regulatory mechanism because of the way they store their DNA. In bacteria, DNA is kept in the form of a giant loop. This loop is generally exposed and can be accessed by regulatory proteins at any time. Eukaryotes store their DNA in a tightly wound superstructure called chromatin, and this chromatin gets bunched up into chromosomes. This superstructure involves a large number of proteins that organize and sort the DNA strand as it's wound up into a larger supercoil. For example, the DNA strand makes two loops around a large globular mass called a nucleosome. The nucleosome complex is then tightened onto a growing pile of other nucleosomes, all tightly wound up within DNA into a rope that's about, mm, give or take, 30 nanometers thick. Other proteins stabilize this supercoiling and they reinforce the bonds holding everything together. This 30 nanometer thick rope of DNA and proteins gets looped around a long scaffold protein, which itself folds down to form chromosomes. So the chromosomes, the little things represented on this season's cover image, are huge DNA protein superstructures. The chromosome's limbs are coiled appendages of scaffold proteins, surrounded by the fluffy looping 30 nanometer fiber. That fiber is itself a supercoiled DNA strand, tightly packed together with stabilizing proteins. In these densely packed regions of chromatin, regulatory molecules like activators, repressors, and RNA polymerase can't access any promoter regions to begin transcription. DNA expression is totally shut off for genes that happen to be wound up in this supercoil. The structure is kind of like a string that keeps getting twisted tighter and tighter. As the string twists, it eventually won't be able to twist in quite the same way anymore. Once it gets wound up tight enough, the entire string begins to coil up on itself. If you keep twisting it, the coil moves up the length of the string until you have a very tightly wound supercoil. When the DNA is wound up into this dense protein-packed supercoil, biologists call it chromatin. So what if the cell wants to express a gene that's currently all tied up in chromatin somewhere? The answer seems obvious. A region of the chromatin is loosened. The regulatory proteins can then access this loosened DNA. But what are the mechanisms behind this process? One mechanism is called DNA methylation. Another mechanism is called histone modification. Let me start with DNA methylation. At various points in the DNA, typically in sequences around a promoter, there are cytosine residues, or CG sequences. The CG sequence is mirrored with a GC sequence on the other strand. Both cytosine bases are methylated, which is to say that they have a methyl group attached to them. The methyl group is just a single carbon molecule bound to three other hydrogen atoms, represented as CH3. These methyl cytosine groups are called CPG sequences, and they're signals for the DNA to condense into chromatin. Regions of DNA with a higher concentration of CPG sequences will thus be packed tighter into chromatin. The methyl groups can be removed, which effectively removes the signal for DNA to condense in that region. Regions of the chromatin that have been loosened up to allow for transcription will thus have low concentrations of CPG sequences. The other mechanism for chromatin remodeling is called histone modification, and this involves the addition or removal of various chemical groups to the histone proteins that compose the nucleosome. 
When I discussed proteins in episode 3, I covered the R groups, or the side chains, on each amino acid in the polypeptide chain. The R groups can be acidic or basic, positive or negative, or polar or nonpolar, and these qualities determine how the polypeptide chain folds and the functional capacity of the finished protein that it becomes. The chemical groups added to the histones work in much the same way. They're polar or nonpolar, acidic or basic, or they have some other quality that makes them interact in particular ways with the DNA, as well as other histones and other molecules. For example, a basic chemical tag called an acetyl group with the chemical structure COCH3 can be added or removed from the histone. When the histone is acetylated, a positive charge is reduced. Specifically, an amino acid within its structure called lysine has its positive charge neutralized by the acetyl group. Remember that positives and negatives attract. DNA is negatively charged because of all the phosphate groups in its backbone, while the histones are relatively positively charged molecules. When the histone is acetylated, its positive charge is reduced, and it shares a weaker attraction with the DNA. Not only does this cause the chromatin to loosen up, it also causes the DNA strands to loosen up from the nucleosome. This region of DNA is then exposed to the regulatory molecules in the cell, which can then access and begin expressing various genes. Have you ever heard the term epigenetics? It refers to this pattern of DNA methylation, or histone modification, which is heritable and can be passed from parent cell to daughter cell. Recall how earlier I was describing how various types of cells are all different because they selectively express a handful of genes, even though they all contain the same total genome. When a specialized cell replicates, its daughter cells inherit the same pattern of epigenetic regulation that ensures they will have the same specialization as their parent. This is to say that a skin cell will only divide to produce more skin cells, and a liver cell will only divide to produce more liver cells, and so on and so forth. The pattern of epigenetic regulation is preserved, and this creates a lineage of cells sharing the same specialization. In addition to epigenetic modifications, the eukaryotic cell also uses sequences within the DNA to assist in regulation. Some of these sequences are near the promoter, and are called promoter proximal elements. These sequences bind to specific proteins, which then attract or interfere with the enzymes involved in transcription. This increases the specificity with which the cell can express genes. Both bacteria and eukaryotes have promoter proximal elements, but only eukaryotes have sequences called enhancers. Unlike promoter proximal elements, the enhancers are sequences of DNA that are positioned far away from the promoter, sometimes more than 100,000 base pairs away, upstream or downstream, on either strand. These enhancers are like random start points for transcription. A suite of proteins called transcriptional activators will cluster around the enhancer sequence and initiate transcription from there. Eukaryotes also have regulatory sequences called silencers, and these do the opposite. Their repressor proteins bind to the silencers, and this impairs transcription. Okay, so now that I've laid down some of the biochemical framework, let's reflect for a minute. Cells use positive and negative control to regulate gene expression before transcription. These control mechanisms rely on proteins called activators and repressors, which can stimulate or suppress expression of a gene. All kinds of different cells express different genes. These genes are organized into groups with different promoter regions, different operators and initiators. It takes an equally varied group of activator and repressor proteins to bind to all these different sequences and interact to sustain life. So not only does one type of cell have a library of activator and repressor proteins, these are just one of many different libraries used by many different types of cells in the body. The point here is that there are a tremendous number of proteins involved in the regulation of gene expression at just the transcriptional level. These proteins are called regulatory transcription factors. Muscle cells have one suite of transcription factors, while neural cells have a much different suite of transcription factors, each suited to bind to the promoters or regulatory sequences of the genes that those particular cells need to express for their particular specialization. Transcription is suppressed when transcription factors bind to silencer sequences, or when the DNA condenses into chromatin and basically blocks out all the transcription factors. If you thought this wasn't complicated enough, just wait, there's more. Where the regulatory transcription factors are needed for the expression of specific genes, a more general class of proteins are required for all transcription events. These are called basal transcription factors. They don't bind selectively to genes, 
They bind to all promoter regions and stabilize a large macromolecular complex. This also includes a suite of proteins collectively called mediator. The mediator complex connects the regulatory transcription factors, the basal transcription factors, and the RNA polymerase, all needed to actually synthesize the mRNA. Every time a cell wants to express a gene, it needs to get all of these proteins and enzymes organized together into this huge complex mass of chemical machinery. It takes this whole thing to start transcription. Once transcription is complete, the cell has produced a molecule of mRNA. The next big step in gene regulation takes place here, after transcription, but before translation. This post-translational control can take many forms, but the form you're probably most familiar with is gene splicing. Recall from the episode on transcription and translation that RNA produced by RNA polymerase has alternating sections called introns and exons. The introns are cut out and usually thrown away, and the exons are pieced together into a functional strand of mRNA. After the cell has cut up the RNA into its constituent introns and exons, it can choose to also exclude an exon or two. By omitting an exon here or an exon there, a single gene can code for a large number of different mRNA molecules, which in turn leads to the production of an equal number of different proteins. This is called alternative splicing, because the cell is using splicing to create alternative versions of the original mRNA sequence. It's believed that up to 90% of our genes produce RNA that can undergo alternative splicing to create alternative mRNAs, which means that up to 90% of our protein coding genes are able to code for multiple different proteins. Also recall that a produced mRNA molecule undergoes a brief period of modification. The mRNA is given a tail of repeating adenosine monomers and a molecular hat on its 5' end. The polyadenosine tail is like a telomere, it protects the end of the mRNA from degradation. The shorter the tail, the less degradation the mRNA molecule can withstand before the genetic material itself starts getting damaged. A longer polyadenosine tail can endure degradation for longer periods of time. Basically, this means that the initial length of a polyadenosine tail can be used kind of like a timer. The mRNA is functional only for as long as its polyadenosine tail can protect it. So mRNA that needs to be cleaned up quickly will be given a short polyadenosine tail. Conversely, mRNA that needs to stick around for a while and be used in repeated rounds of translation are given a longer tail. Translation can also be prevented through a mechanism called RNA interference. Basically, a hairpin loop is formed between some complementary sequences in the product RNA. This hairpin loop is chewed up by enzymes to produce a short RNA molecule about 22 bases long. This short sequence is absorbed into a larger molecular complex called RISC, or the RNA-induced silencing complex. This complex then binds with the molecule of mRNA. If the binding is a perfect fit, the mRNA is targeted for destruction. If the binding is slightly imperfect, it may not be destroyed, but it still can't be used for translation. Translational controls typically involve some kind of interference in the mechanisms of translation. For example, a ribosome can be phosphorylated. This causes the ribosome to distort, undergoing a conformational change that reduces or eliminates its functionality. Post-translational controls involve manipulating the protein in some way to activate or inactivate it. Understand that translation is the process by which a molecule of mRNA becomes a protein. So after translation, the cell has to deal with a polypeptide chain, not a nice little molecule of mRNA. If you listen to episode 3 about proteins, and episode 9 about enzymes and energy, you should understand that proteins can be in an active or inactive state. In the active state, their conformation is suitable to perform a given task. In the inactive state, the protein is denatured or in some kind of conformation that renders it useless and unable to react with any substrate molecules. Proteins can be activated or inactivated like a light switch. Just like you can turn the light switch on and off, the protein can undergo a small modification to transition between active and inactive states. The most common form of post-translational protein modification is through phosphorylation. A phosphate group carries with it an extremely negative charge. When the phosphate group is added or removed from a protein, the introduction or removal of such an electronegative particle will induce a conformational change in the protein. This change is like the trigger that moves the protein into or out of its activated state. Instead of being phosphorylated, a protein can also be given other kinds of molecular modifications, like a small carbohydrate or polysaccharide tag that acts as a chemical signal for other molecules. 
Sometimes a portion of the final protein has to be broken off, and only after a portion is removed does the protein become activated. In other cases, the protein doesn't need anything added or removed to it, but it still needs help folding properly. These kind of proteins might naturally fold into their inactivated state after being synthesized, and require other enzymes called chaperone proteins to manipulate their conformation into an active state. Furthermore, a protein can be destroyed if it is no longer needed, and its parts reused or recycled into new proteins. In cases like this, some kind of chemical tag is put onto the protein. One such chemical tag is called ubiquitin, which is quite literally ubiquitous in the cell. Ubiquitin tags are placed all over a protein marked for destruction, and a complex called a proteasome recognizes these tags and proceeds to destroy the protein. There's a very Robocop-esque feel to it, although this is nothing compared to the mechanisms involved in the immune system. That's a whole different topic that I'll be covering in a future series. That's about all I have for this episode. I think I covered my bases pretty well, but just in case you feel a little spotty, let me briefly recap everything I discussed. So cells have positive and negative control mechanisms. Positive control is the active expression of a gene, while negative control is the active suppression of that gene. Bacteria keep their DNA loose. It's always available for transcription. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, keep their DNA in dense masses of chromatin as a negative control, and loosen up some of this chromatin as a positive control. Regulatory sequences in or near the genes can bind to all sorts of regulatory molecules that can assist or suppress transcription. These regulatory sequences are also used to organize and coordinate the expression of multiple genes at once. It should be noted that eukaryotic transcriptional control is orders of magnitude more complex than transcriptional control in bacteria. Once transcription in eukaryotes has produced an mRNA molecule, the mRNA can be spliced in a variety of ways to produce multiple different proteins. Other molecules of RNA can bind to the mRNA and destroy it or prevent its translation. Once the mRNA has been translated into a protein, the protein can be activated or inactivated through a variety of mechanisms, including phosphorylation, reconfiguration, and targeted destruction. The purpose of this tightly regulated gene expression is to coordinate the extremely complex chemical dance required to grow and maintain a living organism. Improper or failed regulation of gene expression can cause serious problems. When gene expression goes haywire during fetal development, the downstream effects can be so disastrous as to be lethal. In order to develop properly and keep itself alive, a healthy organism must have exquisitely controlled gene expression. Just like the conductor must lead an orchestra to play a grand symphony, the cell must precisely regulate its expression of genes in order to grow and survive. Alright, I think that about wraps it up. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you learned something cool about the way the cell controls the expression of its genes. Gene expression is a very important aspect of biology that seems to have an influence in virtually everything, so it's good that you now have a solid groundwork of information to work with. Again, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.